Healthcare is too expensive. Employers are offsetting costs onto their employees. Who will make health benefits affordable for hardworking Americans and their families? You will. This is the Empowering Plans Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you once again emphasize the benefit in Benefit Plan. Now prepare to learn, plan, save, and protect with the FIA Group. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the FIA Group's Empowering Plans Podcast. Today, you've got me, Nick Bonds, on the pod with one of our newbies. Kendall, say hello to the FIA people. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you here, Kendall. This will be Kendall's first pod. Kendall, you've been at FIA just over three months now, right? Yep, I hit the three-month mark at the end of June. Well, it's time to throw you into the mix here. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, I guess we can start a little bit about your background. What brought you to FIA, really? So I graduated law school last year, and I had sort of always had an interest in healthcare. My father is a firefighter. My mom has been a nurse for, gosh, 35 years or so. So healthcare was always something that really interested me, and FIA is a really great place that they have so much industry knowledge and a lot of great intelligent people working here, and it just seemed like a great opportunity. So I'm happy to join this team, and it's been great so far. You graduated law school from where? I went to Suffolk in Boston. Suffolk. I'll try not to hold it against you. It's okay. <laughs> I graduated New England Law, and we liked to brag that we could beat you guys at softball. I'll leave I didn't that. Know that. For... <laughs> All right. Well, we do have kind of a heavy topic today. Here at the end of June, we essentially saw the one-year anniversary of the official announcement, I guess I should say, of the Dobbs decision. Dobbs, as I'm sure everyone listening is fairly familiar with, was a landmark case that essentially rewrote the whole framework for how we look at abortion rights law in this country and how plans have to approach their coverage and their decisions around coverage of abortion rights. So why don't we start with a little bit of the backtrack? We'll kind of lay some of the stage. So Kendall, do you want to go back to Roe and talk about sort of where this whole process started? Yeah, absolutely. So we first saw sort of abortion rights back in 1973. That's when Roe was decided. So this was almost 50 years ago. So this was very long-standing precedent that we saw modified a little bit, but very long-standing. So basically in that case, the Supreme Court recognized the right to abortion under the right to privacy under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And what that did was it basically prevented state laws from broadly prohibiting abortion access So in their decision, they tried to really balance the women's right to privacy with also the potentiality for human life and respecting that as well. So they really sort of instituted regulations that had to do with trimesters. So really, the only place that states could really regulate was either in the second trimester when it reasonably related to maternal health, and then in the third trimester, once the fetus reached viability. States were allowed to regulate or prohibit abortions entirely with the exception of saving the health of the mother. And then I think from there, a case that kind of gets overlooked frequently, and this is a Mm -hmm. weird point of mine, but I always like to remind people that the modern framework under which abortion regulations were analyzed stems Mm -hmm. not specifically from Roe, but from Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which is a 1992 case that rose out of a challenge to a Pennsylvania regulation that actually imposed a waiting period requirement, spousal notice requirements, and for minors, it imposed a parental notice requirement before a patient could receive an abortion. That was challenged basically as an unconstitutional restriction under Roe. And when this case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court looked at Roe, looked at the precedent, and essentially upheld the general concept behind Roe v. Wade, that there is a constitutionally protected right to abortion, but they changed the framework in which abortions are analyzed. You'll hear a lot of attorneys talk about the concept of strict scrutiny, basically the highest hurdle that a law has to pass to be constitutional if it's held to the strict scrutiny standard. For Casey, the Supreme Court essentially decided that strict scrutiny didn't apply. What they applied instead was an undue burden standard under this fetal viability framework. So they got rid of the whole trimester analysis, which they said was awkward and unworkable. And they also reasoned that, you know, advancements in medical technology meant that viability was pushed out farther and was a more reasonable standard by which to judge these cases. So essentially what the court said 
was that prior to fetal viability, states couldn't regulate abortion. But at or past the point of fetal viability, states then had an interest in protecting the potential health of the potential fetus and could impose regulations, but still states had to be mindful of not imposing an undue burden. And so that's sort of the undue burden standard was how we judged whether abortion regulations were constitutional or not. Any substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion prior to fetal viability, any substantial obstacle that imposed an undue burden was unconstitutional and would typically be struck down. Those are still routinely challenged since Planned Parenthood, and that kind of brings us up to Dobbs' decision, which was leaked awkwardly a couple months ago. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's, again, a whole other podcast where you probably go down more <laughs> else. But the Dobbs' decision, Kendall, do you want to lay out sort of how that shifted things for us? Yeah. So Dobbs was decided a little bit over a year ago now. It was June 24th of 2022. And that effectively overturned Roe and Casey entirely. And the Supreme Court found that there wasn't a constitutional right to abortion. So it was no longer a federally protected right. And so basically the effect of this was that it returned to the states. So the states now have the power to regulate abortion. So we've seen a lot over the past year of how the Dobbs decision has affected employers within states, but also just how different states have taken different approaches on regulating abortion. So as far as restricting abortion access, there's been a lot of state action currently. 13 states completely ban abortion entirely. And then some have taken a little bit of a more moderate approach by just imposing gestational limits on abortion. So not a complete ban entirely, but still regulating depending on gestational timing. So we've also seen states implement restrictions regarding medication abortion access. So this would be abortion pills, which is actually the most common method of abortions in the U.S. And states have put restrictions on that by either banning them entirely or limiting what providers can do with them. We've seen some states limit the mailing of medications and they require in-person, in-office visits for women to obtain medication abortions. A recent state to touch on was in Wyoming. Wyoming was instituting a ban on abortion bills, which was temporarily blocked by a district court judge. So currently that law is pending proceedings that would have taken effect on the first, but we see a block. So currently women can still access abortion pills, but it's just another example of a state trying to restrict that. I think five or six other states have recently had their Abortion laws challenged all the way up to their state Supreme Courts, and a lot of those are currently being held up. So I think it's a good reminder that just because the state passes a law or if a state had a trigger law that took effect, that's not the final word. So we're seeing some exactly. of these laws still kind of shake out through the state court system. So sorry, I can all you go. No, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's certainly not cut and dry just because a state wants to pass a law doesn't mean that's actually what's going to hold up. Abortion is such a hot topic. So there's always challenges depending on what laws are trying to be passed in certain states. But yeah, the landscape is constantly changing with abortion on state action and what current states are deciding to do after Dobbs. So here at FIA, we really monitor those state changes. We have internal resources that we maintain to stay up to date on new or changing abortion laws throughout the U.S. So we encourage you to reach out to us if you have any state specific questions on where your employers are and if you have any concerns about how they should go about administering their plan depending on what state they're in. Yeah, state changes can happen fast. Even on a federal level, the changes can really it will get whiplash from how quickly some of these will turn around. We remember after the Dobbs decision came out, HHS came out with issuing federal guidance basically saying that despite any state level abortion restrictions, emergency providers are still obliged to provide abortion care in emergency situations where the physician determines it might be medically necessary to provide an abortion to protect the health or life of the pregnant individual, that the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, or EMTALA, would basically require abortions even in the face of state regulations. And that's another fun mm-hmm. example of how preemption analysis is so significant to every aspect of self-funding. It's not just in the ERISA mm-hmm. context. It does come up in other federal versus state law contexts like EMTALA here. That specific instance, after HHS came out with that guidance, I believe Texas itself was pretty quick to try to challenge that guidance in federal court. And I think that it's currently 
entangled. I think it's on its way up to the Fifth Circuit. That's another example. We'll have to keep our eyes out to see how that evolves and changes and how it might impact the self-funded plans that we work with. It's not all restrictions, though. Some states have tried to take steps to expand and protect abortion and reproductive rights access. California, Oregon, Washington, Vermont even amended its state constitution. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker actually signed an executive order expanding abortion access, which led to legislative action in Massachusetts to expand and protect abortion and reproductive rights. We may see more federal action from the federal legislature. Congress might move to revisit bills that could enshrine abortion access into federal law, sort of codifying Roe, as the phrase goes. I think a constitutional amendment is probably impossible at this stage in our democracy, especially with the 2024 campaign starting to kick into high gear. On that note, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some kind of executive action from the Biden administration or if we see calls from whomever he may be facing in the general election to go another way on reproductive rights. They can all change so fast, really, is the big takeaway. We're doing everything we can to monitor that and be a valuable resource to the groups we work with, wherever it comes up, whatever states they're working in, whatever laws they need to be mindful of, trying to keep an eye out for those developments as they come. Another aspect of the preemption analysis from the ERISA perspective is that self-funded plans do enjoy that preemption of state laws that specifically relate to a self-funded plan design, which means that any of these state abortion restrictions that specifically try to dictate what plans do and don't cover will largely be preempted, which gives self-funded plans that similar latitude to cover or not cover abortion access. One thing we are seeing a lot of employers move towards is trying to find ways to cover, if not abortion access directly, trying to cover travel expenses or telemedicine related to that care. The interesting thing about travel expenses is that it itself can be deemed a medical expense or medical care under the Internal Revenue Code. So it should not only be possible to reimburse by the plan, but it could also be an eligible expense under account-based plan designs. So if a plan wanted to establish an HRA or an accepted benefit HRA to promote abortion access through a travel benefit, that's an option we've seen a lot of plans explore. You have to be careful sometimes about the way that's implemented, particularly when you're dealing with states like Texas with a headhunter law specifically targeting anyone trying to facilitate or directly provide access to abortion care rather than the abortion care itself. But a broad travel benefit should be a fairly safe approach for an employer looking to extend that kind of coverage. But again, it's something that has to be done with care. And plans also need to be mindful too of how their network benefits and out of network benefits are structured. Kendall, I think you had some thoughts on that, some aspects of the coverage they need to be aware of. Yeah, a huge thing that you had kind of already mentioned, but just like really important to know is the ERISA preemption aspect of it all. We know that ERISA preemption will preempt any state law sort of relating to a welfare benefit plan, but that key kind of term of relating to, it appears that it would probably apply here. And we don't really have any case precedent that confirms that. We haven't heard a court sort of say, because this is such a new like country landscape that we have after Dobbs, we don't really know how a court would decide on this. So while it appears like ERISA preemption would apply here, it's just something to be mindful of. It's almost um, surprising, right? That we haven't seen yeah. case law on this specific issue yet, but I'm sure it's coming. No, absolutely. I'm sure it will. But yeah, at least for now, we don't know, but we'll be sure to update you if that changes. And if we do hear something that sort of gives us a more solid stance on where the courts would lie on that. Another important thing is now, so if employers choose to broadly cover reproductive rights, what does that mean for employee access? So it might be covered under the plan, but it might still be challenging for employees to access abortion if it is prohibited in the state where they live. In that case, they would likely seek out-of-state treatment. And so it's possible that that out-of-state physician is at a facility that's out of network, depending on what the plan's provider network would be. So typically in that case, we would see higher costs to the employee if it's not covered under the plan being out of network, but some plans do have provisions which allow for out of network coverage under the plan where an in-network provider in the area is not available. So it's just important to be aware of what is in the plan and what you provide as far as in-network coverage and out of network coverage, because that will dictate 
what the employee will have to pay out of pocket, depending on where they have to go to access treatment, depending on whether or not it's legal in the state where they reside. And that also really ties in well to how this law has affected providers. Now that Dobbs basically put all the power back in the states, there's a huge legal risk that providers face depending on what states mandate and what states don't. They have people coming to them from out of state where it's illegal where they live, but they go to a state where it might be legal, but the providers aren't really completely sure of where they stand and what's legal as far as providing care to these patients. So there was a really interesting study that the Kaiser Family Foundation put out, and they found that providers in states where there are gestational limits on abortion have expressed a difficulty in their ability to practice with their typical standard of care that they provide. They're struggling to provide the same level of care just based on the sheer number of people they're having to care for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're also facing difficulties when it comes to limitations on medication abortions. Like I said previously, some states have restricted it so that they can no longer mail medication. So they have people coming in office more often than they would. And there's just a more difficult process in treating patients than there was before. So that just presents challenges that we're not really used to seeing since the DOPS decision happened. So now that we sort of have an understanding of how this is affecting employers and employees, what does this mean moving forward for plans? Big key is awareness of what the plan does and does not cover. Not only just abortion coverage or reproductive health benefits, you also, like I said, have to consider in-network and out-of-network costs and what your provider network is and what that means for employees if they're seeking treatment out of state. And like Nick mentioned too, your plan might provide that you cover travel and lodging expenses for members that seek treatment out of state. So that's just another important thing to consider. I think it's an important distinction there too that the IRS code treatment of travel expenses can distinguish between travel specifically and lodging mm-hmm. more broadly, depending on yeah. how your benefits are worded and where mm-hmm. you're going and how long they're staying there. That can present some tax and reimbursement issues for employers too. Mm-hmm. So it's a very very fact-specific analysis based on mm-hmm. where you are, where they're going, what state law might be applicable. So just always be mindful that there's yeah. a lot of layers to unpack. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of nuances to this. In my short time at FIA, I've really discovered how important plan language is. The smallest word can make a huge difference. So it's important to understand what's in your plan and what you cover and how it's worded. And A shell yes, versus yeah. a may can be a huge <laughs> Yeah, it makes a huge difference. So it's definitely, certainly very important, especially with how things are constantly changing in this area. And, and then too, that not just reviewing your plan language, but employers need to be mindful of all their other communications between them mm-hmm. and their employees, making sure that they're clearly and accurately conveying what they cover, when they cover it and how they cover it. Yeah. Yeah. That can definitely prevent unnecessary costs down the line. So having that clear line of communication is definitely key. And then lastly, I think another thing to mention moving forward and looking to the future for plans is understanding the risks associated with this. With everything shifting, it's just some states have laws that could put the plan at risk. Some criminalize aiding and abetting or assisting a state resident in getting abortion, which also ties into why providers have difficulty in this area. They just don't really know what's permitted with things constantly moving. So it's just understanding the risks of the state where you are, what does that mean for you and your plan and your employees? And just, yeah, basically have an understanding of what you're legally allowed to do and how you plan on implementing that into your plan and for your employees. Yeah, well said, Kendall. I think that mostly covers everything that we wanted to hit for this pod, but I'm sure we were so articulate and so thoroughly detailed in our discussion (laughs) that nobody has any questions, but if you do, Do not hesitate to reach out to to the PGC team or the ICE inbox, wherever you access us, we are here to help. So any questions Mm -hmm. that come up, again, I would just reiterate that it's a very fact-specific analysis. There's, Mm -hmm. like Kendall said, many layers to unpack. So Mm -hmm. Kendall, do you have any other closing thoughts? No, I don't think so. I think we had everything. I'm happy to join and I can't wait to be back. I'm sure I'll be back soon. So yeah, looking forward to it. First pod in the can. Congrats, Kendall. In the books. We're done. (laughs) All right. right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you, Pat, our intrepid engineer. We'll close it up for today and we'll see y'all next time. Thank you, everyone.